Hello. Hello. Am I audible? Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, I guess no one is going. So, welcome everyone to my talk. I am going to talk about the shiny new histograms that is going to come in from APS soon. Yeah. So, I am Ganesh Varnekar. I am a software engineer at Grafana Labs. I am a Prometheus team member and I maintain the TSDB in the Prometheus. So before we talk about the shiny new histograms, let's see what is a histogram. A histogram lets you distribute your observations into multiple buckets. Let's take this example. So in all the examples that I talk, it's I am going to observe the latency of a request. So on the y-axis, it's the number of requests. On the x-axis, it's the request duration. So in this particular histogram, we can what we can get out of this is there are 15 requests that are less than 0 0.1 second latency. There are 25 requests from 0 0.1 to 1 second and 1 to 2 second. And the last bucket is special. It encapsulates all the requests that were greater than 2 seconds into a single bucket. So how do we store this in Prometheus? So in Prometheus, we give one time series for each bucket. So we have a label for a series called LE, which means less than or equal to, and Prometheus recognizes this special uh, label as the bucket value for a time series. So for, so for this particular uh, histogram, we have four bucket uh, time series, each mentioning here the bucket boundaries. And if you notice, it is less than or equal to. So the first time series, which is 0 0.1, includes all the count of all the requests that had latency less than 0 0.1 seconds, which is 15. And the next one is less than or equal to 1 seconds, which is all the requests that were before 1 second. So it includes the first uh, bar and the second bar. Similarly, the third time series is a sum of first, second, and third bar. And there is a plus infinity bucket, which is everything before infinity, basically the total count. And we have two additional time series for the entire count and sum. So this is a problem. The first problem is we have to predefine these bucket boundaries even before instrumenting. Like when you write the instrumentation code, you have to mention these bucket boundaries. And it can get tricky, and it can take some experimentation to get these bucket boundaries right. And the buckets are cumulative. If you see this particular example, we have four uh, buckets that are filled. And I have changed the bucket boundaries a little bit. But we have defined a whole lot of time, uh, bucket boundaries for this particular histogram. So lots of time series are going to be empty. Basically, lots of buckets are going to be empty. But still, each time series is going to take memory, disk space, and a lot of other resources that come with the time series. And it's going to slow down queries a bit. Yeah, because the bucket's empty, but they still exist. Yeah, and if you got the bucket boundaries wrong, and if you want to re-instrument them again, you have to re-instrument all the applications with the new bucket boundaries, and you have to redeploy it everywhere to uh, get the new buckets. This can also be a problem. For example, if you changed your bucket boundaries in an incompatible way where, uh, for this example, the left buckets and right buckets are not matching. And if you know about the Prometheus queries, the labels need to match to do any kind of comparison. So in this example, you may be able to compare the bucket 1.0 and bucket 2.0, but all other variations are incomparable. So you will have to wait for some time so that you have all the new buckets ready. Yeah, And for every histogram that you define, the number of total memory series, which is the time series that Prometheus consumes, is number of buckets plus 3. So why, why this is a problem? Uh, uh, take an example. You are uh, instrumenting the requests, and you have sharded the histograms, like one histogram per uh, status code per route. So this is a simple example. Let's say you have 1,000 pods which are instrumenting these histograms, and a single bucket uh, takes about few thousand series across all your deployment. So even if you add, let's say, five additional buckets, it's going to take exponential number of, um, not exponential, but a huge number of time series. So here comes the new uh, 
uh, histograms that we are working right now. It's in POC stage. We have a huge design. And we'll build it step by step in a simple way. I'm leaving out a lot of details out of this so that it's easier to understand. So what I'm going to talk in the next five to 10 minutes explaining this is a multi-year study and research by Bjorn, who is here with us right now. So Bjorn, myself, and Dieter, my colleague from Grafana Labs, we worked on the code and all this POC. We, we are calling it proof of concept because few things here and there still need to be defined and standardized, but most of it is ready and open source at the moment. Yeah. So the first property of the new histograms, uh, you don't have to predefine your buckets. The buckets are already predefined for you. But you can set the precision, like the resolution factor of the new histograms. For example, let's take the factor of 2 power of 1. What does it mean? It means the, you multiply a bucket boundary with 2 to get the next bucket boundary. And we always start with the number 1. So if the bucket boundary is 1, the next bucket boundary will be 2, 4, 6, 8, and so on. Now, this is one resolution of histograms. And we always have the factor as some power of 2. If you want to lower the resolution, like the gap between two consecutive bucket boundaries is huge, you just take the factor as 2 power 2, and you get the bucket boundaries as 1, 2, 4, 1, sorry, 1, 4, 16, 64, and so on. And you can take the factor of 2 power 4, or 2 power 8, and so on. You cannot have the powers like 2 power 3 or 2 power 5. The powers are also power of 2. And this is about the going up, uh, going uh, lower resolution, which means uh, bigger buckets. If you want to go in the other direction, the factors look like 2, and then 2 power 1 by 2, which is square root of 2. The next will be 2 power 1 by 4, which is square root of square root of 2, and so on. So you multiply it square root of 2 with 1, you get the next bucket boundary. And then you multiply it again, you get the 2. You don't have to worry about this math. You can just assume that it works. And we will see soon how this solves all the remaining problems. And if you see the color, uh, colors, like once you go up, uh, like you, once you increase the resolution, for example, let's take the factor of 2 power 1 by 2 and 2 power 1 by 4. So we have three bucket boundaries in above. And when you increase the resolution one step, a new bucket boundary comes between all the bucket boundaries that were there before. And if you take the third and the fourth example, all the boundaries from above remain the same. You just get new boundaries in between. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I just talked about the uh, boundaries which come after one. If you want before one, you just divide the factor. So everything after one, you just keep multiplying the factor to get the new boundaries. And before one, you keep dividing, and it keeps on going, getting small. So why is it like this? So uh, if we just glance at this for a moment, we see that between resolutions, there are some common buckets. So that helps us move from a higher resolution histogram to a lower resolution histogram. In this example, the first histogram uses a factor of 2. So the boundaries are 1 to 2. 2 to 4, 4 to 8, and so on. So if you wanted to decrease the resolution of this histogram, you choose the, the next factor, which is 2 power of 2. And you add the buckets which fall into the new buckets, and you get the new histogram. And you increase the, uh, like, lower the resolution again, and you get the new histogram. So why do we want this? We saw earlier that if you change the bucket, bucket layout, you cannot match the buckets between two histograms again, because they can be incompatible. But with this, uh, the first histogram above is of uh, resolution 2 power of 1. The second is of 2 power of 2. So if you, let's say if you wanted to add these two histograms, you just convert the histogram of a higher resolution to a lower resolution. And now you can do any kind of arithmetic that you want. So that's the power of predefining buckets to some power of something, so that histograms of different resolution can be compared together. Yeah. So I have skipped the step of converting the high resolution to a lower resolution, but you can match the colors. The yellow bucket matches here, and the blue buckets are added together to get the blue bucket. Yeah. I'll move on to the next slide. 
And because we have predefined the bucket boundaries, now you have to just only specify the, uh, the factor that you want to multiply for every new bucket boundary. So now that the bucket boundaries are fixed, you don't need to store the bucket boundaries itself in the storage because encoding float numbers is expensive and not very efficient. So we can use integer numbers, which starts from zero, goes up the number and down the number line. And this is very efficient to encode and takes less space and less CPU to encode and decode. So we give the ID zero to the bucket, which has the upper boundary as one. So in these are three different solutions. One is two power of one, the second histogram is two power one by four, which is a higher resolution bucket. The next is two power of two. So we start at zeroth bucket and every new bucket gets the ID one, two, three, four when the bucket boundaries are increasing and when it's decreasing, we go in the negative direction. So, so we have built up all the information that we need about the histograms and this is how we encode it. We take a, we take an example of this um, histogram. So the first part in the histogram is the metadata which encodes the resolution, the total sum. Resolution is just the factor that we talked about, two power of two power of something. And the sum and count. This is enough to decode the rest of the histogram. So the next part, we call it a span, which tells you what's the bucket layout in this particular histogram. So if you observe the histogram, the first four buckets are consecutive. They are one after another. And then there is a gap of two buckets, and then there is a bucket again. We are using the factor two power one. And let me use that to decode what's written in the span. So we have zero comma four, then two comma one. It means the first bucket starts at index zero because the first bucket has an upper boundary of one. And at zeroth index, there are four buckets, hence zero comma four. And the next two comma one says that after the previous set of buckets, you have a gap of two buckets. So you have to skip two buckets. And the next stream of buckets is of length one. So you have one bucket. So this compressed format tells you what's the bucket layout. And now you know which buckets are filled and which buckets are unfilled. And we just store the count in each bucket consecutively there on. We don't need to map the buckets with the count. We just have the bucket layout and the count and we can use some kind of efficient encoding to store this. And we now have only one time series per histogram because all the bucket layout and the values are encoded into a single piece. We map one time series to all the histograms. Currently in Prometheus, a sample, which is a, a sample has timestamp as int 64 and a value as, as float 64. We just replace the float 64 with the new encoding that we just described right now. And yeah, and you just have one time series. Like if you increase the number of buckets or decrease, it doesn't change the number of series and it's efficient. Uh, like there was a talk in PromCon last year and we saw that this new encoding without uh, having one series per bucket gives about more than 90% of index size savings if you have too many buckets previously and roughly around 50% of disk size savings. Yeah. So how do you instrument this? It is as simple as this. So everything remains same as previous instrumentation and you don't define your buckets. You just define what factor you want to use. So here I have example of two and four, four is to power of two. And you don't need to get the precision very right. The instrumentation library automatically chooses the closest precision from what you uh, define. And as and when you observe any values, the buckets are filled automatically. You don't have to uh, like, yeah, it's just filled automatically. The new buckets are created if it has value. If it doesn't have any value, the bucket does not exist. Hence the name sparse high resolution histogram Sparse comes from the fact that we don't care about empty buckets. We don't store it anywhere. Higher resolution because with this efficient encoding, you can now afford to have hundreds of buckets in a histogram and it doesn't really make a dent in the resource consumption. And in this proof of concept, 
uh, uh, the scraping looks like this. Uh, currently, we have a HTTP request which asks for a text format matrix, which gives a time series uh, in the format that we saw earlier. And we do another HTTP request to get the new sparse histograms. We are encoding this new sparse histogram in protocol buffer format because it's more efficient and can be easily described, like the new histograms can be easily described in protobuf compared to the text format. So Prometheus does two requests to a target to get all the data that it needs. Now it's finally time for demo. Like, I cannot mirror my screen, so I'll try my best to give the demo because I have to see here too. So I'm running Grafana here, and I'm running a Prometheus which supports uh, sparse histograms. And I'm running some synthetic load. This is something called Storyteller and some other synthetic load that I did. Like we have two synthetic loads, and I'm going to show a live load soon. So this is the context of what's running right now. I will get another browser on the screen. Just a second. So I have like the instrumentation example that I showed is the same thing that we're seeing here right now. So I have two histograms. One is called media, lower resolution, whose factor is two power of two, which is four. And the medium resolution is two power of one, which is two. Don't worry about the, that number. I'm going to use different timestamp to show you different values and arithmetic like we have implemented a bunch of FromQL functions which work on these new histograms. So I'm going to get this histogram at a particular time. Yeah. So at this time stamp, we have three buckets filled, 0 0.5 to 1, 2 to 4, and 16 to 32. Yeah, this is the same histogram again, but different buckets are filled, which either overlaps with the bucket that is above, or it doesn't overlap and there are empty buckets above. So, okay, this is not really comfortable, but I'm trying. Are you able to see what I'm able to show? Okay. And if you add the buckets, they're kind of merged together. Like it's the same resolution. Now let's, let's take an example of merging histograms that have different bucket layouts. Now we have two histograms. The first histogram's resolution is two power of four. The second histogram's resolution is two power of two. And if we do a sum of this histogram, the resultant histogram has a factor of two power of four, which follows the concept that we discussed earlier. The higher resolution is converted into a lower resolution 
and they are added together. And we can also do stuff like histogram quantile of At this point, I'm just giving examples of what works, what's present, and stuff. Yeah. I'm adding data at the constant rate, so you have the histogram quantile. Now ends the boring part. I will move on to the interesting part that we wanted to show. OK. So remember, I have something called, uh, sorry, before storyteller. I'm going to show a live cluster with heat maps. So my friends at Grafana Labs, they worked on a new efficient heat maps. Uh, the, the name are Leon and uh, uh, Ryan. So the currently heat maps crash when you have too many buckets. Like we tried to render some high resolution histograms a few months ago, and the laptop just crashes because there are just too many buckets. Because for every bucket, you need to have a time series. Now, uh, this is actually scraping a live cluster. We have a Mimir, which is uh, like Mimir cluster running in our dev environment. We have instrumented it with this new histograms with a very high resolution. And we have a Prometheus running in dev, which is scraping these histograms. And I'm port forwarding that pod and connecting into a local, uh, local Prometheus. Yeah, these are just requests. And here you can clearly identify that there is a band of latency. There are different bands of latencies. One is here, one is here, and one is here. And if you look at the y-axis, they are very close together. Like the buckets are very close together, and the browser did not crash. But this is still not the full capability of the histograms. Like I have a bunch of other histograms. I'll jump into. Another histogram. Yeah, this is again a synthetic load, but there are so many buckets that it looks like a continuous gradient. So I just wanted to show that we also have a heat map which is compatible with the new histograms and it works super efficiently. And you can just play with this. Like there is a story behind why this heat map looks like this, but I'm going to skip that story for now. I had a bunch of backup slides in case the demo did not work. <laughs> and if I had to show how fast the histograms load, I can just try running a 6R query. And it should just load, I guess. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Did it load? Yeah, I guess it loaded. Six hours of query, yeah. And how can you use this? So everything that we saw here is open source. Um, the instrumentation is available in the client Golang library, uh, client Golang repo, but it's in a branch called Sparse Histogram. Similarly, the Prometheus server that we ran is open source, and it's in the Sparse Histogram branch. And the Grafana, it is actually running the main branch, but the new heat maps are. Uh, hidden behind a feature flag. And with this, thank you. Do you have any questions? <laughs> yeah. So if you have any questions, I was asked, like, you can go towards the mic, which is at the center, and ask there. Or if you can shout any question from here, I can say the question again.
so the question is like the scraping happens by protobuf for the new histograms and is there no text format? The answer is no, there is no text format implemented for that. And I don't think we'll have text format at the end unless we find some super efficient way to do it. Hi. Um, yeah. <clears throat> thanks for the talk, it was very interesting. So I get the mathematical properties of this. I think it's pretty, pretty nice. Um, but let me know if I'm looking at this correctly. So let's say we're measuring latency and we, our latency for a specific endpoint is, uh, has a normal distribution centered at around uh, like 200 milliseconds, right? Um, so if we don't do anything, most of our, uh, and so it, we have a standard deviation that makes it go from like 150 to 250, right? So if we, depending on the factor that we use, we're losing a lot of precision there, right? Like most of it is going to the, to go to the same kinds of buckets. Is there a, like are you thinking about this, like with, to play with offsets and scale so that you can uh, get the best resolution for your metric? So can you repeat the last part? Yeah, so like, what would you recommend, right? Let's say that's our situation and we want to have, like to take advantage of most of the uh, precision, right? Like where most of the precision is, yeah. right on the area where our metric has the most variability. Okay, so when you set a precision, the bucket boundaries are fixed. So you cannot ask to focus on a particular range of values. But what could be done is like, there was another option in the client library which I did not mention is you limit number of buckets that you want. So you can set a very high precision and a limit on buckets like 150 or 200 which is still very practical with these new histograms. And once it hits that, for example, 200 bucket limit, it will automatically go into the next lower precision. For example, if you are using a precision of 2 power 1 by 8 and it hits the bucket limit, it will automatically switch to 2 power 1 by 4. So okay, that's then. the best thing possible at the moment. Like you can start that's with the highest resolution. Also, at every particular interval, uh, there is something called a compressed unit of histograms called chunks, which contains 120 histograms at a time. So once those 120 histograms are done, uh, you start a, okay, this is wrong, okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so it's possible that you can reset a histogram. For example, after every 10 minutes or half an hour or one hour, you can set it to reset the histogram so that you again start with the highest precision and low number of buckets filled. So that's another way to move back to high resolution again. Okay, got you. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, thanks for this. It uh, seems very elegant. Um, it might be a misunderstanding of mine, but I feel like the, uh, or it seems like the, the, the sort of uh, distribution of the buckets across the number line is assuming the data is going to be followed like a long tail distribution. Um, like there's going to be uh, more sort of um, like samples at the lower end of the number line mm. and they'll get more and more sort of spread out as you go up. Is that yeah. correct? And yeah, if uh, so, like what if the data doesn't fit that? Yeah, uh, that's correct. Like if you set higher precision, the, buck the size of buckets is going to be small up to some extent and it just exponentially grows. Yeah. So the idea with this was the gap between two consecutive buckets, like the percentage difference between two consecutive buckets is fixed. So, and whenever you do a quantile estimation, the error of your estimation is limited to what's the difference between the buckets, like the percentage difference. So the idea was to reduce the percentage error of the histogram quantile estimations. And if you take the plus infinity bucket currently in Prometheus, if there is a value which falls in that bucket, you cannot accurately predict within a certain percentage if the quantile estimation is correct, if it falls there. Mm -hmm. So that's right, like the spread will be big, but if you take the percentage error of your estimations, that's going to be limited wherever you go. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, thank you for uh, the presentation. It was very clear. So I've seen that uh, you added the instrumentation in uh, the Golang uh, Prometheus client. Are you planning to add this feature in other languages like uh, Python library, for example? Yeah, so this was just a proof of concept. We are still playing with it. Once this goes into Prometheus, for sure, 
it will just spread to other client libraries. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. We still have five minutes, I guess. Do you have one more question then if you uh, don't mind? Uh, uh, Is that okay? Okay, uh, you can ask the question. Okay, I was just gonna ask, um, like, if you were to, to go ahead with this, it sort of sets a precedent for non-floating uh, point val uh, series values. Do you think there's other use cases for that? Like with, you know, once, once that precedent's been set, are there other? Um, uh, precedents, okay. So you mean how will we, have both the histograms together, you mean? The old histograms and the new histograms? Uh, no, more like once, you, once, you've, uh, once you've allowed like non-floating point numbers as series values for this case, are there other kinds of uh, series types that you might do something okay. similar for? Yeah. Um, so doing changes to uh, if i understand your question right uh, you mean we replace float 64 with a different data structure yeah. is there scope to add different more data structures yeah so there is uh, it's possible but the big problem that comes with it is making any change to the data type requires changing the tsdb the promql engine and everywhere you access the sample so if you have to make any change, there should there needs to be a very solid use case that it's required, and in a like many if if it has a bigger use case, it's possible. Yeah, okay, thank I would you. say it's possible, but it will require some real big use case for that to happen. Yeah, yeah. Makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, and your question was how will old histograms work with the new histograms? Okay, so your question was how can we access individual buckets? So uh, we have a, prom a huge design doc explaining all the PromQL things that we want to do with this, and this is included there. So we, we will have the ability to ask for a value at a bucket, just that it's not implemented at the moment. Uh, no, yeah. we, we are just running it in dev. We are still playing with this. Yeah. We have just one Prometheus, which is scraping just one dev cluster, which is instrumented with fast histograms. Yeah. Two more minutes. I think a lot of the previous questions were around uh, the bucket distribution, right? It seems like the center of mass of the distribution will be around zero right now. Uh, one. Uh, yeah, so, so, exactly. It will be around one, and then it will spread out exponentially. So is it possible to add a single offset? So for example, if you're measuring latencies, you can say plus 200, and then it will be, the center will be around 200, which is where the normal latency would be, let's say. So when you say the center of mass, it is just the calculation which starts at one, like the like the calculation of bucket boundaries which starts at one. But the observations that you do can be uh, centered anywhere. But the problem with uh, centering the calculation somewhere else is it creates a problem again. You cannot mix and match other histograms. Okay. No, I mean the buckets will be the smallest, the most high resolution near one right now, right? Like the smallest, most fine grained buckets will be near one. Yeah, because of the multiplication factor. Right, right. But if people could sort of move that fine grained resolution buckets to 300 ms where the latency will be, I think there'll be uh, higher accuracy quantile function results, right? Mm, yeah, that's possible, but again, it kind of skews the bucket layout and makes it incompatible with each other. With the merging, yeah. Yeah. 
I guess we are out of time. Thank you for joining the talk.